Eyes on Longmont, offering a diversity of topics about our community that will inform and entertain you. We invite you to sit back and enjoy this edition of Eyes on Longmont. Hi, my name is Ross Taylor. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Colorado Boulder. I was a photojournalist for 20 years, working for newspapers and various outlets across the globe. I've covered issues from conflict to daily life, and I wanted to show you today some of my work. Some of it includes work from uh, covering a family in West Virginia to a disabled couple in Connecticut uh, and the year of courtship before they got married. And I've also photographed in places like Iraq, Afghanistan, and India. And I want to show you some of that work today. Importantly, I want to talk about the need to find your purpose and your way on that journey. I think that's incredibly important to think about when you start to enter a life on a photographic journey. And I want to talk to you today about my own journey and how I found my way and my purpose along that path. So come on inside, I'm going to show you some of that work. Hi, I'm Ross. I'm Ross Taylor. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Colorado Boulder. And for many years before this, I was a photojournalist. Um, I, I now live in uh, Denver and, and work in Boulder, but before that, I had a long career um, and uh, it was rooted in the tradition of journalism and photojournalism. And I want to talk today about a little bit about that path, uh, some of the lessons importantly learned along the way that uh, um, influenced my photography and my approach to communication and what I try to pass on to my students now. I want to start with a, a slide called Find Your Way. I teach this notion a lot and I run workshops on this idea of uh, finding a purpose and being uh, having intent with what we do as, a, as an anchor point into all that we try to approach. And I, when I was thinking about this, I thought back to uh, Grizzly Peak. I like to I like to hike a lot, like many people in Colorado, but I also really like to winter hike. And I, uh, it's one of my favorite things to do in Colorado. And I was hiking Grizzly Peak, which is mid 13er in winter uh, last year. And I like to solo hike a lot. And as I was climbing the mountain, I got off trail. It was kind of hard to see. And, and then I'm, before I know it, I had made a mistake and, and I was in my hands and knees trying to climb up the wrong side of uh, peak, coming out of Grizzly Peak. And as I, as I was climbing up, the, thinking about the difficulty of that hike and thinking about well, why, am, why am I here? And as I, as I sat there in the snow and sat there uh, feeling very alone, I remember trying to think, Ross, why, why am I doing this? And it was just funny because it triggered, uh, it, even in the discomfort of the moment, uh, it, it started thinking about um, the idea of purpose. And I started thinking about why I'm on this hike. And then I started regressing back to some moments before when I first arrived in Colorado. And then I started thinking about um, my life before Colorado. And then it triggered to, uh, triggered to, my time in photojournalism. And I kept thinking about all of the things that had led to this moment in time, 
about finding my own way and finding my own path. And I knew that there was only one way, which is, sounds kind of trite, but it's this notion of uh, there's only one way out, there's one way up. And I had a sense of purpose, but I kept thinking about the past as I, as I reoriented myself and uh, kept moving forward. And during that moment in time, as I was on the side of the mountain, I, I started thinking back to the beginnings of my career. And I'm in my mid 40s now, but as I started in photography, um, I, you know, I, I by no means would have the answers to a more nuanced understanding of what my purpose was, um, my own way, my own path. And it began with a family called the Rose Family in West Virginia. My, my father worked with a, a home repair project in central Appalachia, and he uh, worked closely in a county called McDowell County. It's one of the poorest counties in West Virginia. And he, uh, he introduced me to the Rose family. And when I would come visit him, I was at the intersection of graduation and when I was intrigued by photography. I was really shy and I was really nervous still. And I had a keen interest in photography, but I didn't know how to express that. I didn't know how to convey intent or purpose, but I had an intersection with the Rose family. And I'm so glad I did because it was the beginning of really changing my life and I'm, I will always be grateful to them. What you see here is uh, Maxine to the left of the photograph. The right of the frame is a house um, par partially owned by the family. They are split. Maxine was married to a man named James. They got divorced. Uh, James lives in that house in the white. He remarried to another woman. Maxine lives to a house to the left that you don't see. They decided to co-raise their 10 total children between the two families. And I thought it was this really remarkable blend of, of chaos and, and love, and um, they immediately accepted me into their family. And why I reference this is because I didn't really know what I was doing. I just simply knew that I loved the notion of documenting, being creative, and exploring. For me, West Virginia was a, an area that I didn't, I, I didn't, I knew well, but I didn't know that well. It was something that was far from where I lived. I grew up in a little town called Mint Hill, North Carolina. And it was seemed like a, a place that, that I could explore. And the Rose family were very giving to me. As a, as a young person who really didn't know what they were doing, they, they allowed me to be with them. And so I accidentally started the path of the documentary life without even really knowing it. And with the Rose family, as they invited me in, I began to photograph. McDowell County, is, as I noted, is one of the poorest counties, and it still is to this day, one of the poorest counties in America. And I saw that reflected in their family. And I began to get a more nuanced understanding of the power of, and the impact of poverty and family dynamics and educational systems, societal. And I, I then began to see, my goodness, uh, one can explore the creative form documentary and, and I didn't realize this, but could be influenced in your own understanding of behavioral patterns. And so I, out of just genuine curiosity, asked them if I could live with them. I, I, at the time, was not focused on generating money. That was not my focus coming out of college. I was more intrigued by uh, curiosity and travel and life. Um, that was my purpose. That was my way. I, I wouldn't have been able to verbalize it um, with such focus, but uh, I, I spent time with them out of genuine curiosity. And uh, the camera was the tool. I, I don't think I could have just, I don't think I could have just hung out with them um, and live with them if I didn't have a purpose, if I didn't have a way, if I didn't have a core idea, even though I couldn't verbalize it yet. Um, but I started spending more time with the Rose family and, and fell in love with them. This is one of the daughters at graduation, and one of my favorite photographs from walking away from junior high. So I just started living with them, and I found that by living with them, I could um, move within the flow of their behavior, with their life, with who they were. 
And this is in the church, man. We were going to a swimming hole that afternoon. It's funny how I, I can't remember last Tuesday, but I can remember the heat of that day. I can still feel and sense so much of that, that moment in time. Um, that's Carlos to the right. This is James. James is sadly, um, he's in jail right now. He uh, has, I, I'm sure, now that I understand much more about the grinding effects of poverty, came from a very difficult background himself. Um, James um, was known as the meanest man in McDowell County. Uh, he would admittedly take some pride in that. Uh, I reference that because he was somebody that did not be messed with. And he, um, he was actually surprised when we got to know each other that I'd actually never been in prison. And uh, I say that because he, it was just part of his vernacular and part of his experience so much. And I say that more playfully, but he, he was somebody who had come from a tough background and, and had um, uh, his antenna up. And he was very smart and is very smart. He wanted to make sure that somebody was not taking advantage of his kids, um, that had good intent. Um, but you can see here uh, his child with his own acceptance is learning how to dip. I'm from the South. I used to dip too. It's very common in the South, tobacco use. It's not um, uncommon. I, I did it uh, for much of my adult life. But you can see here being taught as a, probably an 11-year-old, 10 to 11-year-old kid to start using tobacco. And that would be what dip looks like for those of you who may not know what that is. But you can see at a very young age that, uh, that use. And so we can extrapolate later on that type of lifestyle and, and its influence on our health and behavior uh, later in life. Uh, but again, it's... I wouldn't have known this until living with them. It's just the direct result of grinding poverty uh, around you. Uh, this is Amanda. She and I are still friends. We actually got connected over Facebook, the, the power of Facebook, years ago. And then it led me to me reconnecting with her family. And this is how they would line out the uh, dinner for their children. But even though they grew up in poverty, and I don't mean to be dismissive of the, the effects of poverty like anything. It's like many childhood, there's a lot of joy in it. And I just loved the notion of immersing into their lives. I didn't even know that was a possibility until I did it. And it's not like you can go to school and then you can take a class and then, well, maybe there is, but I'm not really aware of many of them where you could take a class and you can understand the notion that one can live this type of life. And the more I explored it, I thought, God, this is fascinating. I found this utterly intriguing, finding a sense of purpose in your way. This is Alan. Alan now is a huge hulking of a man. You should see him on Facebook. He's enormous, and uh, I still remember him as a small child. This is him getting ready uh, for picture day uh, in his class. And I would sleep and live with them in their housing. And you could see the quality and the, you know, the effects of poverty in their, their housing. And this is a photograph that really sticks with me because that began to, for me, trigger the understanding of where people are coming from and a greater sense of understanding and sympathy and respect and empathy for their conditions. Um, when you think about a child in school and how they perform in school and how they um, how they're able to learn and maneuver an educational system, uh, we don't think of them sleeping in this type of setting as they rest their bodies and as they prepare for the days ahead. We don't, we, I, I can't, we can't imagine that in Boulder, that this would be people living like this. And so when, when one lives with them and um, uh, one sees it directly, it has a big influence on you. And my life started to change immediately through this. And, um, you, know, you walk upstairs and you see this is the, the condition of the house, and it, ca it calls your attention. You know, it, it, it creates for me. It began to create immense empathy for people and their condition, and and a, and a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a demand, in fact, of an understanding, having empathy for where people come from it, is so much of an influential factor in, on how they are. But I. I I, I just fell in love with the notion of this experience. And so I, 
I'm not good at a lot of things. There's, I, could, I could list a whole host of things that I'm not good at, but for some reason photography uh, seemed, I wouldn't say easy, but it came very naturally for me. And there was an inclination towards structure and composition. We can see it here, an exploration of layering and an attempt at breaking some norms and really pushing the envelope, but really um, paying attention to this. And this is one of my favorite photographs. I, I, I like her hand lifting that out and blowing the bubble and there's a lot going on and and I had not been photographing very long but it seemed like it seemed to flow within me and and I wouldn't have been again I wouldn't have been able to state it at the time but I had a strong sense of purpose and I remember many many long bored summer days with the Rose family and this is a good photograph of this I I have to say unfortunately in honoring of um, this is Anthony he he recently died and it and it really hit me hard when he died because he died of carbon monoxide and poisoning. And if he had just had a, you know, a, uh, a detector in his house, he may still be alive to this day. And again, the, the effects of poverty on, on, on populations, he's now gone. Uh, this is Alan and his sister, Tina. Uh, Tina and I, actually, of all the... Of all the Kids became really close. Tina was, was very um, had a lot of personality and was really wonderful. And they were very playful and very caring towards each other. Um, I think it's worth noting that Tina also got strung out on opioids and other um, difficult drugs. And but it's not because I think it's because it's the environment she grew up in and it's the environment in which she um, was placed. And she's had a very, very difficult life. And so when I see this joy, I also, I also unfortunately know the pain and the other side of this. Now, I don't want to relegate her to a certain status where she is because I'm not in her day-to-day -day life, but I, I have been in touch with her family and I certainly hope for a better future. But I do know that um, it has been a part of her, her adult life. And Maxine, to the left, was a central figure to the family, and she's one of the people that I admired the most and was so, so loving towards me, towards her children. And she, I feel like in this photograph, you can see her care uh, towards her, her children. The children just, her um, child had just skinned her knee in the playground, and you can see her pulling up uh, and see her uh, tenderly caring for her daughter. This is one of my favorite photographs of my career. It's not necessarily one of the, the best photographs, but it's absolutely one of my favorite photographs because of what it represents. Uh, some of you may know the movie Stand By Me, uh, and at the, uh, uh, there's a moment where they're all walking on the railroad, well, not a moment, most of the movie is them walking on the railroad tracks. And, there wasn't much to do, and this is, I'm dating myself well before internet, before cell phones, and uh, you're much more present in the moment. And we just went for a walk, and we spent mo much of this day back in the hills of Appalachia, West Virginia, walking deep along these railroad tracks, and then we would explore the mountains, and it was amazing just to spend the day. And on the way back, we, Alan in the center got a bunch of apples and we picked it from a tree and you can see him in his shirt He's got it all full of the apples that he picked and I don't know why I can remember this But I can remember it like it was yesterday that he looked at me after eating a bite of an apple and said today was a pretty good day And I, I always think about that like that one day was really really great and that that really really impacted me and the notion that you could you could live a photographic life you could live a documentary life and you could have amazing moments in a key just focused intent of enjoying the present and I wish I had thought about what worked because in my career if I had really thought about all the things that worked really well right off the bat my life my career would have taken off a lot sooner. Um, what worked was I worked through an intermediary. I worked through my father. I couldn't have just gone up to the Rose family and said I wanted to document you. I needed to go through an intermediary. My father worked with them. He spoke on my behalf. 
I was really clear of intent with them. I talked about my purpose and I was, you know, I was, um, I was honest and direct. I wanted to document their family. I wanted to just be there. Um, I was really honest. Uh, they're like any person. Um, there are things that I'm good at, some things that I'm not so good at, but I, I feel like one of my strengths is honesty and directness with people. And it, it played out there for sure. And I have a lot of insecurities or fears like many of us as well, again. But for some reason I found strength and uh, a lack of fear that I felt like I could just be alone. Um, again, no tide, no internet. You could be off the grid, so to speak, no phones. You could um, just fully immerse yourself. And I, I, I did not have fear. I had fear, but it, I minimized it. It was not that big. But importantly, I think all this comes from a respect for condition. The more that I was exposed to it, I had a, a deeper respect for their condition. And that comes from, from me uh, listening to people. I, when I, especially when I do documentary work, I try to not just hear, I think we, hearing is maintaining eye contact and we can almost sometimes, many of us just pretend that we're listening. Um, but I, I really do try to listen. I listen for cues. I look for body language. I listen for um, where somebody's coming from. I try to really focus on entry points into their lives and understanding where they're coming from. And I, I think that's a core element. And I was willing to spend time. So I live with them. I lived on the couch. I lived in their house. I lived in their space. I spent months with them, months with them. I was willing to spend a full immersion into their lives. It, it was joyful for me. It wasn't hard, but I was willing to put in that time. And I'm, I'm glad I did because uh, that that's important. It's really important to, to do all these things that I just you know, listed out um, because if I had not, I, I would have been lost. I wanna, I wanna retell a story real quickly there was a time when James came into the uh, house that I was staying at, and he, um, I remember hearing a banging on the door. James is the father of the family, and it, he, I opened the door. I was in um, uh, Maxine's house, the other house, and I saw a, a van outside. Uh, it was humming in the winter time at this time, and uh, I can still see that, and he, he, smelled of alcohol, he was drunk, and he said, you get in the van. And he, it was not a request, it was a, you know, like, you need to do this. And so I got in the van and there was somebody else, or I'm sorry, truck, I got in the truck and there was another person in there that I did not know. And I noticed there was a gun on the, on the floorboard and I don't think that was by accident. And James said, we're gonna go for a ride. And I got some questions for you. And he drove me up to the back of the holler, and I thought, you know, I'm in trouble. I'm, I'm off the grid, I'm in the back of a holler, uh, you know, this man's drunk. And he, he, we went to the back of the holler, and he said, what the heck are you doing with your, um, you know, what are you doing with my kids? What are you, why are you fake taking all these pictures? And if I had not been honest, if I had not been direct, if I had not, if I was, if I had not minimized my fear, if I had not done all these things, uh, I, I think, I would, I would have been in trouble. But because I had a sincerity of purpose, because I was not fearful, well, I was f fearful, but because I had minimized my fear, because I was direct and honest, I just, I could look at him in the eye and say, I, I like spending time with your family and I wanna document it. And that short truncated statement was enough. And that got me in. And he looked at me and his friend, and then all of a sudden it became playful, and he was like, let's go get some beer. <laughs> and it was like a completely different dynamic at that moment. But he wanted to check me. And that lesson, at the time, I wish I'd paid more attention to this idea of really knowing your purpose. And for many years after that, I think I was lost. I cycled out of that. Then I was trying to find my way as a photographer. I was really more trying to get an opportunity that somebody else would give me instead of seizing it and creating it myself. 
And, and for, many for many years, I really struggled. And I, I wish I had all those lessons learned and that I wish I could verbalize that and have expressed that to employers and to, to those around me. I think I would have moved a lot quicker in my career. And I remember uh, even bleeding into my early 30s with a conversation with my father. I deeply wanted to be a photographer, but I was struggling. I was very, you know, you hear these stories and they're almost flippantly, but, you know, I was poor. I had no heat. I remember staying in an apartment with no heat and no air conditioning. I was, I was on the edge is an understatement. And I was not doing well. And I had a conversation with my father. And I remember the food court that we were having lunch at in Charlotte, North Carolina, where he works. I was visiting him. And we sat in this food court. And he said, Ross, you know, what are you going to do? And I remember thinking, ah, you know, I gotta, I gotta make some changes. I gotta, I gotta figure this out. I, I, I don't want to give it up. And it's funny because I still, when I go back to visit my father now, years later, as a, as somebody who has had led a full career in photojournalism and has come out the other side, I still go to that food court and I still, I still sit in that that area. I don't remember the seat, but I go there and pay homage to that, as a, as a, as a real key turning point in my career. And one of that is, is really rooted in the sense of purpose. And I think um, understanding a sense of purpose uh, was, is paramount for me, paramount for me. And then once I started understanding, uh, I have to identify that within myself. Um, I, I, I can move mountains. And that was a big turning point for me, big turning point. And uh, this can be illustrated in a, in a simple story that I'm so grateful for. I wanted to do documentary work and I thought I played baseball growing up. I loved baseball and I can remember playing Little League. It was my favorite things and I wanted to do a documentary on, documentary project on Little League. And uh, I had a mentor who said, well, unless you need to reel it in and just focus on one home dugout instead of trying to do this grand sweeping epic on Little League baseball, just focus on 10 feet of space, 12 feet of space, one dugout for an entire season. And I'm glad I did because that changed my life. It's in that space where I learned the cornerstone and the underpinnings and the flow of behavioral patterns that impact how I approach documentary. I, at the beginning of this, would try to take pictures of children and let's say they would strike out or they'd become upset. A parent would say, why are you taking a picture of my kid right now? Uh, they're, they're crying, don't, don't do that. And I remember thinking, gosh, how do, how do the great photographers capture the, the, the wide ranging scope of the human emotion? And I can't, I can't even photograph a, a 10 year old kid um, at a baseball game who may be upset. And a coach looked at me and said, well, why don't you, Ross, why don't you, why don't you introduce yourself to people before the game and let them know who you are and what your purpose is? Now, to me, that seems so automatic. I would, I would absolutely do that, but I didn't know that at the time. So at the beginning of the next game, I said, hi, my name is Ross. I work for this newspaper, you know, and here's my purpose, and here's what I'm doing. And in that game, I felt a little tug on my sleeve. I looked over and it was a parent said, you got to come over here. My kid's crying. <laughs> you got to get a picture of this. And I thought, that's, that's interesting. Why, why does that work? And so I started every game. I would say, my name is Ross, and here's my purpose, and here's who I'm working for. And it's like everything became much more open. And so I started testing this out. Wherever I would go, I started, I started um, trying this. It was this, like this directness that I'd never had before minimizing the fear and saying, my name is Ross, here's what, who I'm working for, and here's my purpose. And I would think a lot beforehand about my purpose, and then I would state that succinctly to people. And I, it was another event, a tough man competition, like a local fight competition. I gathered all the fighters beforehand, before the event. Normally I would have just shown up. Here I said, my name is Ross, here's my purpose. I want to also document backstage. Why do I want to document backstage? Because I also want to document um, you know, the, what you're going through and the passion of the sport, which is not seen in the ring, but is demonstrated in the locker room. 
And all the guys said, yeah, man, come on back. After the fight, this girlfriend tugged on the sleeve, so to speak, said, you got to come back here. My boyfriend is laid out on the table. I think that's you know, interesting. So I went back there with them and um, put his hand on him. She was tending to him. And I think normally if I had gone back there, the guy would have said, why are you taking my picture? But because deep in the back, he had already had that conversation with them. And I think, why well, no? It was easier for me to do that. So then I started thinking, my goodness, can we, can we, can we scale this? I, in, in business terms, it would be scaling it. Uh, but I thought, can I do this in photography too? Can I, can I scale this? Can I do this in other arenas? And so I started thinking about what inspires me and, and can, I, can I apply this towards other things? And I, I had seen a, a documentary on somebody going through the death process, and the death and dying documentary, and I was incredibly moved by it. And I thought, my God, can you, you can actually document somebody through that? And so I met with the local hospice in my town, and I said, you know, I, I'm, I'm curious. I, I want to I know what that's like. And I think that directness, um, that transparency uh, resonated with them. And so they connected me with a woman named Gloria Marin, and I will always, always be grateful to Gloria for opening up to me. Gloria was diagnosed as terminally ill. And I met with her and her family and with hospice. And we talked about documenting her. And Gloria was incredibly giving to me. And I started a journey with Gloria. And this is Gloria. She had lung cancer. She was... Um, I think mid to late 50s. She's not old. And it's funny, as I continue to age, she becomes increasingly looking younger. I remember in my mind's eye, she looked older, but I was even looking at these pictures the other day, just thinking how young she looks. And she grew up in the South um, and then smoked from a teenager. Very common for people around her. But goodness, was she a lovely woman. Very, very, very kind, and she just emanated love. And I wanted to start with this photograph because Gloria turned a, made a turn for the worse pretty quickly. Her lifespan, the projected lifespan, was shortened. And right when we started, uh, Gloria uh, got some bad news. And this was a very difficult picture for me to make because I'd never made anything like that. I'd never borne witness to somebody. She was realizing in the moment that she did not have much time left. And I had to make a decision. Am I here to photograph or am I here to be her friend? I could be friendly and photograph. And I made a decision to document it. And that was not easy for me to do. But that was a turning point. And the understanding that my purpose was to photograph the impact in somebody going through this process and those who are impacted by it. And Gloria didn't mind. And that lesson was not learned on me because I'd stated my purpose, because I was clear of intent, because I was not fearful, I, I didn't hold back, I was honest. This photograph was allowed. This is Mike. I think it's important to show people caring for Gloria. And I wish I had more time to see how people cared for uh, Gloria uh, so that you could see that representative of the photographs. Um, so I think this is an important photograph to make. Um, this is them before going to bed. This is Sassy, her dog. Sassy is kind of naughty in a playful way. Uh, Sassy would always get into everything, and Sassy would climb up often besides Gloria and would... Uh, I remember thinking, gosh, she looks a lot like Gloria. And I think Gloria, if, if she were... I, well, I know. If Gloria were alive, she would think that... This would be a, a cute photograph of Sassy for sure. Um, yeah. And this is, a, this is a really important photograph of my career, both career-wise and personally, and here's why. So Gloria was getting pain management right here. This is in her bedroom, and because I like the Rose family, I didn't live with them, but I, I virtually every spare moment I had was in their home. Sassy got up in the bed and was curious. And Gloria looked at me in the room. I was in the other side of the room, and she said to me, Ross, why are you, um, why are you so far away? She kind of whispered it. I said, come, come closer. 
It's actually hard for me to. It's hard to recount. But she said, come here. And I got on top of the bed. She said, come here. And then she said, she looked at me and said, I love you. And that picture really hit me because, so I'm sorry, that I remember thinking at the time that you could do intense work and it would be accepted and it would you know, deeply impact your life. And that moment was really intense for me and it still is to this day. And I, I remember thinking at that time that there's no, there's no, going, I'm sorry, there's no going back for me and that I really needed to continue this type of work. And um, my apologies for becoming emotional, but that was a really life-changing moment for me. And, and uh, yeah, it was in that moment that I realized that I, I wanted to have a life of purpose and that I, I wanted more a sense of, um, thank you, I wanted a more sense of, um, gravity to the type of work that I wanted to do because I felt more meaning in it and I felt more I felt I felt right I felt right and this is uh, her family coming in as she made a turn for the worse and this is interesting to note because this is when I began to learn the more complexity of uh, pre what I would call predictive behavior um, and how at root we're all very predictive and we can lean on that in the documentary form I predicted that, uh, you know, when she dies, I wanted to be very small in my, in my presence, that it was going to be a highly traumatic and highly intensive moment, and I need to be small. And so I started talking about the family, but I'm going to be in this corner. I'm going to be in this right corner, and that this will be my spot. So I would often retreat to that just to start solidifying that. And then when Gloria died, you're going to see this in just a second, Mike, the family called me. And she had passed here. And so when I went into their home, you know, everybody's devastated. And the last thing you want in the privacy of somebody's home at the death of a loved one is for a photographer to be making lots of noises. And so I went to my corner and just sat there. And Mike to the left turned around and said, it's really hard to get to know, to love somebody so much. I remember him whispering that under his breath. It was really intense, and he looked at me and said afterwards, he said, Ross, don't, don't, don't take this picture. And what am I going to say? I can't, in this moment, say no, no to that. But he, he caught himself. He said, wait, never mind. That's the whole reason you're here. You're here to document this. And he allowed me to continue photographing. And it's because I expressed my purpose to them. It's because I had been honest with them that he understood my intent and allowed me to continue in this very, very fragile moment. And I am always grateful for him and grateful to Gloria that she allowed me into this very vulnerable space. It, it, it's changed my life and I, I will always be grateful to them. And this is them carrying out Gloria. I think the documentary has really opened my eyes to so many things. I never really thought about you know, how, does, how, how do we get carried out of a home? I never even stopped to think about that. This really, really hit me, just the, how death will impact us all. And, and you know, this is a pretty heavy experience for somebody who was youngish in the form, but I remember thinking, I can't not do this type of work. Now I've tapped into something and I really want to understand the breadth of the human experience more. And so I started applying this wherever I went and I became, because I had greater sense of purpose and greater sense of intent, I was even, I had more, I was, I was bolder, I had more directness with people. Uh, you know, I could be invited, it's funny, I, I could be invited to a party and I'm sometimes the most socially awkward person in the corner. Uh, I can be so shy in so many aspects, but in photography, 
I can be so fearless. And it's so interesting to understand the difference and why. And I think it's just because I have a strong sense of purpose when I worked. And so I started this almost daily like search for meaning and daily search for stories. And when I was working for a newspaper, I, I found uh, this couple, Tom and Teresa, and really impacted my life too. Another turning point, Tom is blind and Teresa has cerebral palsy. So Tom can't see, but he can move. Teresa was bound to a wheelchair and could see but couldn't move. So Tom, I saw them in the parking lot. Tom was hunched over, pushing her, and she, her head was back, you'll see in a second. And it was a very resting sight. And I wheeled off the, the uh, little teeny highway and pulled into the parking lot where I saw them. And I said, this is a big part of the wave where I would just say, hi, I'm Ross, what's your story? And they told me that they were a couple that lived in a disabled village um, or village for you know housing for disabled community, I should say, um, and that they're, they're dating and that they're gonna get married in a year. And I thought, oh, that's fascinating. Um, tell me more. And I asked them, can I, can, let's meet, I'd like to talk to you. And they said, sure. And they gave me their story and their background, and I said, yeah, this will be fascinating. Could, could I document your courtship? You don't often see um, amorous relationships in the disabled couple represented media, and I think it should be seen. I think it's worthwhile, and why not? This is something I would honor this for sure. And they told me in an early meeting, they said, they said at night they hide, what's called hiding, where they would come and cuddle with each other. They were very religious, so he slept in a separate room until their wedding night, but that they would quote hide and uh, and hiding meant from the pain that, of their lives and all the difficulties, they would go hiding. And so instead of normally in the past, I would have tried, maybe it would have taken me you know, a few weeks or a month to get into their space. I thought, you know, my purpose is to document you. My purpose is to reflect your relationship. So let's start the first night of documenting with you hiding. So this is one of the first photographs I ever made of them, it was in their bedroom, it's around 11 o'clock at night. Instead of trying to work my way into it, I just started with intimacy. I started with the purpose of documenting their relationship. You can see, it's a, I think it's called a baby alive. Uh, they couldn't have a child together, and so they would, it was just so touching, they have this baby that they could feed um, and pretend play, and it was just an endearing thing, and so they would cuddle with the baby as well at night. And this was really striking to me, and this, this showed me that I don't, if I'm direct and honest with people, and if I'm bold, and they understand my purpose, we can move quick, and I can document the most sacred and the most beautiful of spaces right away. And this is what I saw. So this is Tom and Teresa, and Tom would be behind her a lot. This is in Connecticut, and they didn't have, um, a lot of sidewalks in that town, so you can see how they're in the middle of a busy street, and it's very dangerous for them. And in the story, we illustrated the point of the lack of access for the disabled community. I thought this was really telling. Tom was really amorous towards Teresa. They were very affectionate, and I love seeing this. This was at a Christmas party. So much like the Rose family, for a year, I would spend at least a day, if not two full days, a week with them and often deep into the night. Their life became a big part of my life. And I documented them through their wedding. So just to speed this along, we'll get to their wedding. This is, I love this photograph. This is Tom waiting for his bride to come out of the van. I'm just, this photograph just really hits me. And then this is them at the close of their their wedding party. I just love the, the sense of relief that they found in each other. They would often just like fold into each other like this. And it was just utterly touching and utterly beautiful. And I, I felt so honored to document this. And it's in moments like this that I just loved being a documentary photographer. Who gets to walk alone with a bride and groom like this? deep into the night, and it's just their shared experience. You get to watch this and make a beautiful um, image that's representative of that, that few people see. That, for me, really hit on the sense of purpose. And I, 
I loved it. I was in. And I also wanted to go to the end, so they never shared a bed until their wedding night. And so this may sound strange, and, but I told them from the beginning, you know, I got to be there on your wedding night. And we were playful about it and kind of joked about it. But I thought it important because they never shared a bed until their honeymoon. And so I went with them on their honeymoon and they went to a casino and, and it actually was really good because the casino, while they went, is they have video cameras all around and so they wouldn't be hurt or taken advantage of. It was actually um, a very safe space for them to be in and, and have a hotel. And why this picture is important because it really closed it out well. Most people would have stopped at the wedding. Um, they. Um, we were in their honeymoon, and they're smiling here and laughing. And I said, "What? What are you? What are you doing? What's so funny?" And they said to each other, "We're playing footsies for the first time." And that was an amazing add to the story that they were playing footsies. And we wouldn't have been able to do that if I hadn't been there in their wedding night. And it was a really wonderful way to end the story. So I carried this forward in everything I wanted to do. So I referenced that I'm from Mint Hill, North Carolina. If you look it up on the map now, Charlotte is encroaching on it. It's now so much Charlotte. But when I grew up there, it was Mint Hill, North Carolina. And we did not have big visions. Traveling to DC would have been a big trip for me. And going to another country was out of my even thought process. But photography gave me the chance to think about it. And I started thinking, well, can I apply what I've learned? I also want to you know, travel. And I had seen work in India, and so I decided to go. And photography was a gateway, and it opened up. And this also introduced the notion of exploration and the notion that you can document, create beauty, have purpose, but you can also push yourself and explore lands and, and cultures that you would be previously, at least for me, out of my wildest dreams. And I worked a lot in Kashmir, and that is another turning point in my life was my work in Kashmir. And this is a, a woman outside of an immunization clinic in Srinagar, which is the summer capital of Kashmir. And it's also in India where I began to see a economic situation and some other levels of poverty that I'd never witnessed. Uh, not that India is only this. There's a lot of pushback, and I get it now, especially um, now that I um, have a more nuanced understanding of things about the representation of India. Um, but when I was there, I focused a lot on social issues, and um, uh, it, it really deeply moved me. And some of the beauty and some of the, the aesthetics of India were just astonishing to me. And I, I fell in love with India. It's a country that has played a big role in my life. And it's a country that if I were to ever um, only be, if I were only able to go to one country, it would be to India. This is from a sandstorm in New Delhi. Uh, and it's here where I started learning how to really navigate alone in a different country that didn't speak your language. That required a lot, a lot of mental focus. It required a lot of intent, really getting back to the sense of purpose. And it really required a lot of me to focus and problem solve because the problems were many. This is in Kashmir. This is a, a man who stepped on the landmine. Uh, this has been an ongoing issue and it continues to this day to be um, an area that is rife with violence. And it still remains a quasi-war zone to this day. I, I also had the opportunity to witness things that were uh, uh, mind-blowing to me in the sense that uh, you know, I, I was woefully unaware of the conflict in Kashmir. I will not say that even to this day that I f fully understand it, but I, I do understand it much more than I did when I left. And this is at a militant's funeral. Uh, militants, uh, people in Kashmir who are fighting the Indian government for various reasons. But this is from a militant's funeral. And it's very sobering and um, humbling and insightful to be a person of your own descent in this environment. And it's, 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 very, it's exceedingly eye-opening to experiencing things like this far from your land. This is from a, a gun battle. I've never seen conflict before. This is um, 
militant who had been killed. And it's in Kashmir where I started learning about conflict and I wanted to explore more of that. And so later in life, I, I went to Iraq and was embedded with the US military. Uh, we fortunately did not see any action while I was there. We photographed during the drawdown. So our, our photographs in my time there was more representative of the drawdown. Uh, I have a few pictures from this I'd like to show. I, I think this is worth noting. This is one of Saddam Hussein's bunkers in Iraq, uh, and they were posing for a portrait on that. And I thought that was really telling it, uh, as the war wound down. This is on patrol. This is um, near Basra, between the Iraq and Iran border. Uh, and this is, they would go on waterway patrols and boats. And this is with the Riverine unit. And they would go out and, and, and search for intel on the, the banks. And this is a soldier coming back down the bank to the boat. And this is called uh, the Boneyard. Uh, this is a repository on one of the bases in Iraq where uh, they would um, take discarded or destroyed uh, equipment. Principally, if memory serves from the Iraqi forces, they would put them here. And this is a soldier. Uh, he later said, I I'm glad that you know th they're here and they're not used against us. I remember some type of quote like that. It was very hot. Iraq, uh, we spent our time in Iraq in summer. It was uh, by far one of the hottest endeavors I'd ever encountered. And that led to Afghanistan. So as I was in Iraq, I got to understand a little bit more about how to, to work embed processes and how to work in, in, in the U.S. military and NATO forces and how to, how to be a journalist in embedded situations. And I learned about a trauma hospital in Afghanistan. And I pitched the idea to document this. And in Afghanistan, we um, photographed what's called the Roll 3. It's the largest trauma hospital in Afghanistan. And if you saw any significant injury in Afghanistan, you would go here. So this is one of the, the, the central photographs from the, uh, my project in Afghanistan on the trauma hospital. It's of a, a soldier who stepped on a landmine and lost his leg. At, I think he was 18, 19 at most. And I didn't realize this, but at the time they give you a purple heart, uh, even if you're unconscious. And it was, I mean, it's a touching ceremony to watch. And you see somebody who is in this state receive a purple heart it was really, uh, it was really, uh, again, it's not bad or good. It's just was something I couldn't, I wouldn't even think about. I'd never experienced something like that. He later contacted me and said, I'd like to see the pictures from that day. And I, I was worried because they're very, very graphic. We won't see all of them to the extent of how graphic they are. Um, and I asked him, are you sure? And he said, yeah. So I sent him everything. And I got another email later. I was really worried about its impact on him, for him. I was concerned for him. And he said to me, he said, uh, these are awful and they're hard to look at, but I'm so glad I have them because I can show them to my friends. I can show them to people I care about and they know what I've been through. And I like knowing that, I, that there's a body of work out there that he can show people that give him an, the ability to show what he's overcome. And in a small way, if, if that helps, that's, that's good. This is Sam. This is an Afghan child who was killed by Afghanistan. Um, who knows who was a representative of the Afghan population who had set a landmine, um, not NATO forces, um, but stepped on a landmine on the way home from school and was receiving care at the hospital. Anybody can receive care at the NATO hospital if you were Afghanistan, if you were a member of any type of military force, anybody would receive care uh, at this hospital, even those they were fighting against. And this is the first soldier who lost the leg. I, I, I can remember this moment intensely because I remember as they were removing his leg, uh, you could see a green inchworm, a small little green inchworm crawling around, and not to be graphic, but in the, 
in the stump of his leg. And I remember thinking, how odd. That's from the blast wound from the ground coming up into the leg. And hours later, it's still on there. And so, so you can then see, good, goodness, how things can be unsanitary and how people get infections and these type of injuries and how it can be just deadly. Um, and then just up close and personal, you see the cost of war. And there's no denying that when you see that, it leaves a lasting impression on you. I'm not saying good or bad against war or for war, but it does, for me, when we go to war, there is a heavy cost, and I've seen aspects of it, and I don't take it lightly. This is a child who was in a bomb blast, or not a bomb blast, it was in a blast. We don't know what type of blast. There were just blast wounds. They, they received the child in the hospital and from significant wounds, um, then later died because of the extensive burn wounds. And this is very difficult for me to see because you see an innocent child. Um, we, I won't show pictures of it, but I do have pictures of the skin peeling off because of the burn wounds. And I, I can still, you know, I, well, I see them because I have them. I can still hear the screams of the child. I can still, um, I can play it out and as if it was yesterday. And that's difficult. And that's the cost of war. And it's not good. And when you see that up close and personal, it impacts you. And that child is now dead because of it, because of the cost of war. And then this is them um, closing up the child. They did provide good pain management for the child and did help it, which is, I guess, some, some comfort that it wasn't dying in agony alone without pain management. But it, it's a child who's dead. So a lot of my work, as I, as I close out, I started thinking about... Um, my role, so I'm a professor now, and I still am charged with doing documentary work. And as I was thinking about what type of project to do next, I, you know, I, I, I present pretty heavy material typically. You know, I'm not a lifestyle photographer. There's nothing wrong with being a lifestyle photographer. I'm not a wedding photographer. There's nothing wrong with being a wedding photographer. Uh, I'm just not good at it. I'm not really good at sports. I'm not really good at news. But I'm really good at documenting um, I think intimacy and trauma, and that's where I'm coming to this notion that I think I understand that that is part of the human condition. That is something that I can document with respect and honor, and that uh, there is some unification, some um, I notion of, of community around people undergoing difficult moments. And I think they're often left out because they're hard to document, because many people don't treat them with respect. But I still think they're important to document. And I, and I, I feel confident that community, when they understand the, the per parenthetical of understanding of why this body of work is done, it can help. And so I have, was dating somebody at the time and they were going through the agony of losing their pet. And I, never, I'm not, I don't have pets, so... Um, I have three plants that I try to keep alive, but I don't have plant, uh, uh, pets. And watching her go through this very painful process was new to me. And she had her animal euthanized at home. And I started looking online, and I saw virtually no media on it. And I thought, much like Gloria, I thought, well, okay, I, I want to reach out. I want to learn about this. So I used an intermediary. I started reaching out to groups who deal with at-home pet euthanasia. And I began my most recent work, which is a large body of work on, on at-home pet euthanasia. I'm working on a feature-length film that's in the editing phase right now. We hope to have it done and released into film festivals next year, a uh, corresponding large-scale photographic body that I've been entering in galleries and academic circles, and then we'll also want to publish on a national level in, in journalism outlets. So the body of work is on the last moments of the, of the human-animal bond, the, roughly the five minutes before and the five minutes after it, that that bond is severed through death. Not, of course, it can continue mentally, but spatially the last moments. And it's intense. And right away I thought, my God, this is something I, I never see. 
And we see the level of intensity that people share with their love for their animals. And this is Danny at the right of the photograph. She is um, a vet. She is also the owner of the company and then works with people dealing with the passing. Um, by and large, I can at least attest that it's a much more peaceful process than for many than going into a vet's office or another space. They, they have it in the comfort of their home. They get to choose the place. It's much less stressful for the animal. It doesn't mean that the pain isn't real or it doesn't mean the pain is less, and you can see it here. And it's in these moments that I feel like I feel like the power of documentary um, is, is apparent in the sense that we, I don't like to document things that we've seen ad nauseum. I, I want to add to the conversation. I want to, I want to present something new. I want to try to lend insight to something that we haven't seen. And this is a very hallowed sacred space that you can only enter if you have done the checklist of all the things we've talked about, the purpose, the honesty, the respect for condition, the minimizing fear, understanding why you're there. If you don't do that, you're not allowed, and you should not be allowed. And, but because I do care deeply about these people, because I care, and I can honestly say that, I care deeply for their condition. People allow me into their lives. And these most Beautiful moments. This is a, you'll see a blue pad when a pet passes that, that the, um, they'll have bodily fluids that will, you know, be part of that. So they always have a pad underneath typically. It's a very, in, a very intense, very intimate situation. Uh, and, and almost invariably, inevitably, you see uh, people in this type of posture. It's so heart wrenching and also beautiful. And you see people huddle around their animals in the most intimate of ways. And this woman actually reached out to me not long ago. We, we have stayed in touch since then. I don't stay in touch with everybody just because the normal normalization of passage of time, but um, we are still in touch. And she, she's a really wonderful woman. And I'm, I'm really grateful that her name is Wendy. Wendy allowed me into her life. and. Um, this was a very profound moment in witnessing the last moments with her animal. And I, I'm, you know, you see from young age, we've documented from young, young children to older individuals, you know, the pain is apparent for everybody. And this is moments before the dog was euthanized and the, the owner you know, coming to realize, you know, it's about time. This is a tough moment to witness. They also, much like the soldier, they wanted every single picture, and I'm committed to that. And so I said, you know, are you sure? I'm more than happy to. I always want to buffer it and make sure it's healthy for them, for anybody. Um, but they wanted it, and then they sent me a note saying thank you. I sent them every single picture because I want to be transparent. This is the last photograph of the project that I'll... I'll include the show on. It's a um, dog named Asia. It's a farm dog, and they went out and buried it. And I thought it was so beautiful at the end. They dropped sunflowers in before they buried um, Asia. And again, same thing. The con family contacted me later and wanted pictures. And this is one of my favorite pictures from the, the project, just in the sense of the, the care and love that still is demonstrated until the end. And so I close, as I close this out, and we think, what, what's the summation? What for me at least, what, what are the lessons learned? One of, the, one of the key elements, if I were to ever teach documentary, and now commercial work is different, weddings are different, lifestyle, or different, they have their own parameters, but documentary, I think it's important, paramount, to be clear of your intent. Why are you in front of somebody? Be very clear and direct with people. I always work through an intermediary. I try to have somebody speak on my behalf. I usually meet with that intermediary first, and then they help me connect with people. And I try to be brutally honest with people. And brutally is actually even, that's an aggressive term. Let me, let me take that back. I don't mean brutally. It, I just mean being direct and honest and being transparent with people. And I found time and time again people respond to that. 
As I mentioned earlier, I try not to be fearful. I try to, because of that directness, I can minimize my fear. And people sense that. If they sense a sense of fear within you, they're going to be hesitant to let you document them. And so I try to minimize that because they want to feel like you know what you're doing and why you're there. And I always try to listen for a whisper. And I playfully say this in the sense that I, I'm, whenever I document, I'm always trying to pay attention to clues all around me where are their whispers of behavior. I'm looking for, um, I'm looking for indications in body language. Um, I'm looking to clues all around me. I, I have my antenna up. Uh, I'm, I'm paying attention to little whispers that I can lean on for knowledge. Um, so I'm not just focused on the photograph itself. I'm uh, uh, keenly aware of the, the, the peripheral um, uh, that is unrelated to the visual. And I spend a lot of time listening, not because, I, not because I'm just doing it. It's because I'd actually, I actually, I care. And I think that's important. You need to, I think we, we, we don't spend enough time listening to each other. I always tell this to students. I always say, most people go through their entire day without somebody asking them, how are you doing? Most people in their entire day don't necessarily get that really truthful, how are you doing? And that is really powerful to get somebody to ask them, how are you? There's real power in that. I spend time, whenever I work on a project, when I worked in the vet project, I, you know, I went and lived with the vets and I am bad. I think it's important to spend enormous amounts of time and to always hold respect for conditions. And this is so crucial. I, I can't stress this enough that we must understand that people come from like the Rose family from a myriad of backgrounds that are unrelated to our own background. We must hold that respect from where people are coming from um, and not uh, impose necessarily where we're coming from. And then closing with this notion of purpose, always trying to ask yourself. So at the end of my, at the end of my career, I, or not, I'm still working, but at the peak of my career, Whenever I would be driving to an assignment or before I would photograph somebody, I would always check myself. I mean, almost 100% of the time. I would say, okay, Ross, why are you about to engage with this person? What is your purpose? You need to be able to succinctly say this. And that mental check uh, has really helped me as a documentary photographer. And I'll close just about that hike. So when we think back to that moment in time when I was on the side of that mountain and I was, uh, I won't spare the details, but it was really, really cold. It's December in a mid 13,000 foot mountain. It was, it was cold conditions. I was alone on the side of the mountain. I'm knee deep in snow. And I started thinking about why am I here? What's my, why, why is, why am I here? What's my purpose? And I got called back to Colorado. And then I, I'll tell you, uh, this is a big part of who I am now. And it, it's views like this, and it's having a sense of purpose. And my purpose now is off, also trying to take care of myself and explore this beautiful state. And to be alone on top of a you know, mountain like this in the really harsh conditions of winter, it felt good to summit. And it felt good to be on top and to push through and to have that sense of direction and to get this view. This view, uh, metaphorically, of the documentary experience that few get to have, and I feel very lucky to have been on this walk and this climb and, and to struggle on the side of a mountain, but to, to end up in places like this is, uh, you know, I feel very lucky. Thank you. So thank you so much for taking a look at the work. I, I hope, um, I hope it was insightful and I really do appreciate you taking the time to, uh, to care about other people's stories. And uh, if I can ever be of any assistance, I, I hope to, to be. So uh, look me up online, rossteller.com. And thanks for taking the time to, to share uh, a moment and look over the work. Thanks a lot.